the right question. The right question is, what is keeping my church from growing? The right question to ask, to start with, what is keeping my church from growing? Why? Why do we want growth? Why are we interested in growth? Why is it important that we keep growing? Because when you have a little child, when you have a baby, you want the baby to grow. When the baby is conceived, the doctor is constantly checking on whether the baby is growing. When the child is two years old and going to three years old, you want the baby to grow. Growth is natural. Growth is expected. Growth is natural. Growth is right. Growth is God-given. Is everybody with me? Yes. Yeah. Growth is real. Growth means you're alive. Every plant should grow. Every organism should grow. Every human being should grow. So growth is not. And if the church is alive, the church must grow. It's not just about reaching numbers, but the church must grow. Growth comes from health. Write it down. Growth comes from health. Growth comes from health. And health comes from balance. Health comes from balance. You have nine systems in your body that are working together. You have the respiratory system. You've got your muscular system. You've got your vascular system. You've got your nervous system. You've got all of those systems. And when one of them is out of sync, Something is not working, my digestive system is not working, you know, all my nervous, I run to the doctor and I say, I am sick. Now why do I think I'm sick? Because there is no balance in the systems there. And when everything is in balance, we call it health. I repeat, when everything is in balance, we call it health. So health is going to initiate growth. Growth comes from health. You don't just make something grow, growth happens. But what you do initiate is health. Beta, how are you doing beta? Hello beta, beta do this, beta do that. Go get some exercise, make sure you're eating well. Why do we want health? Because we know that health results in growth, longevity, and activity. All right, so the right question is what is keeping my church from growing? Growth comes from health. Health comes from balance. A lot of churches tend to become imbalanced often based on the pastor and the way he swims. You know, some guys are, they, they, they're all about one thing or they like a couple of things and the whole church becomes about that. And they become very lopsided or every church you walk into, oh, these guys are big on this or they're big on that. Some of them are tradition. Some churches are tradition. Now remember, I'm not saying that these things are wrong. I'm saying that these things are in, uh, if, if they're not in balance, then you've got a problem, you've got a health problem. So tradition, tradition, this is how we've always done it. This is how we've always done it. This is how we, we're not going to change it. This is who we are. And our identity is wrapped up in the way we have always done it. Some are driven by personalities. Pastors good looking, pastors sharp, pastors, you know, loaded or pastors whatever. And he is the one making it happen. Okay, he's the one making it happen. So as soon as you walk into the church, you find that this church is a little fan club and the pastor is a little star over there. He's a little Shahrukh happening, you know, in that, in that uh, context. So some churches are driven by personality. Is that right? Is that wrong? Well, it's not healthy. Finances. Where the treasurer says yes sir, no sir, three bags go sir. If the treasurer says yes, okay. If the treasurer says no, whoa. God himself might want it, but it's not going to happen. Okay, and that organizations or the churches that are set up in such a way that all the missionaries end at the treasurer's desk. <laughs> the treasurer decides, sign go, make go. That's it, right? Finances then decides whether they're going to do a ministry or not going to do, do or not, not do a ministry. Faith doesn't drive that. Shall we do this? Shall we accomplish this? Shall we organize this? Well, do we have the money? If we don't have the money, finish. <clears throat> So faith doesn't drive what God wants to do. And, and you know, almost always, God asks you to do something when you don't have the wherewithal to do it. Always. He always asks you to do something more than for what you are equipped or have. Because he wants you to lean on him, draw from him, grow on him. You get what I'm saying? He's always expecting you to act in faith. Jump in faith. So there's tradition, there's personalities, there's finances. Some want the buildings. I was with a church for many, many years uh, that had a building. By God's grace, I inherited as I walked into the church, I inherited a fantastic four story building, right? And the, the church itself accommodated about 120, 30 people, okay? 
Kiss guitar, okay, we're just absolutely jamming in about 1, 1, 20, 1, 30. Okay, once we fill that out, then we thought, okay, we just do another service. Then we just do another service. Then I wanted to go somewhere else, and I wanted to plant in other cities and other parts of Delhi. Then Ghazabad started expanding, Faridabad started expanding, trans Yamuna started expanding. So we need to get out there. Everybody can't be coming 40, 50 minutes every Sunday morning. They're like, how can you go over there? We have a building. We spent crores on this building. You can't go anywhere else. You have the building. And I'm like, okay, so the building has decided how many people they should have. And the this building has decided whether I should go or not go. And the building often becomes the dictated uh, terms for what and how your church should grow. Buildings become the project. Buildings become what the whole offering goes into. <laughs> All the, all the expense is in maintaining the building, scraping the building, painting the building. My goodness. Some churches are filled with programs. They think that programs is what drives the church. If we can keep on having more programs, if we can be more busy, yay! Everybody is tired, everybody is exhausted, but we are serving the Lord. So some churches are as fast. So as soon as you get to the church, they'll give you the program sheet Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every they got a program in the morning, in the evening, and the people are exhausted running to all the programs. And if you don't show up, nothing you don't love Jesus. You know? So that's a little bit of you know, guilt happening along with that. Some like events, big events, conferences, they're conference driven. Some are unchurched driven. You know, just, okay, get, get it. How many people are we reaching? How many people? Is that right? Is that wrong? It's unhealthy. Because we're talking about, say it with me, balance. We're talking about balance. And the problem with balance is the pastor usually likes one or two things. And then the other things are left at the mercy of whether the pastor has the time, the money, or the interest. And that becomes a problem. Many other plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purposes that must prevail. It's the Lord's purposes that prevail. So if I want my church, if I want, if you want your church to be built to last, built to succeed, built to be blessed, it must be built on the purposes of God. Why? Because the purposes of God prevail. Right? The purposes of God prevail. I want the purposes of God to be the foundation of my church. I want the purposes of God to drive my church. Not tradition, not personalities, not finance. They can be there. There's nothing wrong with that. But it should not drive. Jesus said, I will build my church. Jesus said, I will build my church. And when I build my church, the gates of Hades are not going to overcome it. So by the grace of God, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. Paul, Paul's talking here to Corinthians. He says, by but each one should be careful how he builds. Okay? For his work will be shown for what it is. The fire will test this quality of each man's work. If what he has done survives, what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. That's 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3. There's a four things, there are four things in this. Let me just go through that. Four things we learn from this passage. Number one, God uses skilled people to build his church. He says, Paul says, I was an expert builder. The guy's a tent maker. The guy's a strategist. The guy sees design. He's an expert builder. Anybody who says, I want to serve the Lord. Yeah, but what is your skill? What are you bringing to the church? What are you going to do for us that's actually going to take the mission forward? So we don't challenge people who are good at what they do. We don't challenge people who are skilled at what they do. Sometimes and oftentimes, we are just left. Many pastors, you must be sharing this. Thing. We're left with the people who are available, but not skilled. They're available, but not uh, not not trained, not uh, in the law, not qualified. Correct, thank you. So God uses skilled people. Does God use anybody? Yes, that's not the point. I'm not saying you can't use people. I'm just saying that Paul was saying he was an expert builder. It takes skilled people. There's nothing wrong with having skilling, training, equipping. Number two, write this down. Your ministry will be tested by God. That's not a bad thing. It's a great thing because he wants to reward you. That's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. He wants to reward you. Your ministry will be tested. Okay? Number three. The test of your ministry will be, does it last? 
The test of your ministry is, does it last? So, if you're building your ministry to last two lifetimes, three lifetimes, if you're building your ministry to last until Jesus comes and have a lasting impact, then it requires the right foundation, right? That foundation. It requires the right foundation. All right? Let's talk about the purpose-driven church. Let's talk about what makes a purpose-driven church. First, we begin by talking about what it is not, because my goodness, there are so many wrong impressions, so many misunderstandings about the purpose-driven church. And then, of course, we're going to talk about what it is, right? What makes a purpose-driven church? Let's talk about what is it is not. It is not about your doctrine or denomination. No, this is not a doctrinal issue. This is not a denominational issue. You can be charismatic and purpose-driven, you can be Pentecostal and purpose-driven, you can be Methodist and purpose-driven, you can be Bible Church and purpose-driven, you can be anything and purpose-driven. Okay? I would say hallelujah to that. <laughs> because we're not talking about, and it also brings everybody together. It's about intentionality. It's not about obedience. Right. So what is it not? It's not about doctrine or denomination. There are now purpose churches, purpose driven churches in practically every Christian denomination. Even Reformed Catholic, Reformed Catholic, Evangelical, everyone, okay? And we work with denominations to strengthen the churches. We serve everybody. And I've taught and trained all types of pastors. Number two, it is not about your worship style. It is not about your worship. Corona, the corona. Better the better. You want to yell and scream? Go for it. You want to sit back quietly and hum? Go for it. It is not about the worship style. Purpose driven does not tell you that this is how a purpose driven church worships. It's not. Number three, it is not about being contemporary or relevant. It is not about being contemporary or relevant. This style, we, do, we dress like this, this is what, how we do things. Uh -huh. There are purpose driven small churches of 50 people in a house. There are purpose driven of massive mega churches. So, it's not the style, it's not the way you do it, it's not about contemporary or relevant. It's not that. Number four, it is not about who you're trying to reach. Oh, we're trying to reach slum people. Oh, we're trying to reach city dwellers. Oh, we're trying to reach the upper middle class. Oh, we're trying to reach English speaking, Hindi speaking. But all these it's not about your thing. That's not purpose driven. Number where are we? One, two, three, four, five. It's not about being seeker sensitive. Most people think that purpose-driven churches are out to get, you know, and we, we're shifting everything, watering everything down, making everything very, very liberal, you know, everything very worldly, and trying all the styles of the world just to get people and to become sick. Ah, uh ah, -uh, no, no, it's not that either. It's not about the size of your church. Purpose-driven isn't about saying, hey, come, we'll teach you a secret on how to grow a mega church. This is how to grow. This is not how to grow a mega church. Because I grew up six feet tall, but my brother is not six feet tall. But we both came from the same mother. We both ate the same food. We both had the same parents, same love, same affection. He grew to his size. DNA decided that. I grew to my It's not about size. So it's not about saying, here's a secret. You apply this. Wow. Lots of people are going to come. Lots of money is going to come. Come on. Okay. And lastly, it's not about your location. It's not about your lake. Purpose driven churches are found all around the world with more outside the United States than inside. Okay, let me add one more thing. Purpose driven churches is not about reward. And it is not about saddlebag. And you can be purpose driven without being holding Rick Warren's hand, Pastor Rick Warren, or saying saddlebag five times at the end of every sentence. Right? So it has nothing to do with the church. That church is a blessed church. That church is a friend church to us, to us, to Kelly, to Pastor Kelly, to others. We love that church. We love Pastor Rick. We love his team. And they grew. And they are healthy because Pastor, because God blessed his ministry. And he grew to whatever he could grow within God's blessing and his ministry. Praise God. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless him. Now I have to look at Delhi. I have to look at my situation and I have to look at my context and I need to say what do I need to do to be obedient to God in my context so that the Lord would enable growth. Lord, it is not wrong to want growth. I repeat, it is not wrong to want growth. I repeat, it is not wrong to want growth. Why? Because growth means you're alive. Okay? Growth means you're alive and if you're alive, you'll keep growing. The moment I've grown to full, you're getting with me? Yeah? 
So as soon as you're mature, as soon as you've reached completion of maturity, you're expected to multiply. So growth is always expected. And then when the kids grow up, it's like, okay, grandkids coming, grandkids coming. Why? Growth is, why is it important to define your church's purposes? Why is it important to have a purpose? Why is it important to be clear about your purpose? Because, number one, it builds morale. Write it down. It builds morale. Everybody knows why you're doing it. Everybody's happy to be involved. Right? Everybody's clear to be involved. You walk into a church and say, hey, what do you think is the, uh, is the purpose of the church? She's got her own ideas. Okay, then you ask the next person. He's got her own ideas. And 50 people have got 50 different ideas of what the church is all about. Right? So nobody agrees on that. And usually it's the two deacons that won't agree on it. Yeah, and that's where the committee hits the brakes, right? And that's, yeah, we call that church. We won't play that game. Number one, it builds morale. Let there be real harmony so that there won't be any splits in the church. Be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Isn't that beautiful? It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good. <laughs> it's good to be enthusiastic, but how a direction. That's what he's saying. Where there is no vision, the people, the people, Perish. Okay. Number two, it reduces frustration. It reduces frustration. Because working together is a lot easier when we know where we're going. Does everybody in the church know where we're going? As soon as you walk into this church, do you know what the direction of this church is? Do you know what we're trying to do? You know, is, is it only about Sunday morning and worship? Is it only about having a worship experience or the presence of God? Is it about, you know, what is it about? How can we define it? How can we teach the newest person that? It reduces frustration. You, Lord, give perfect peace to those whose mind is uh, set on you, those whose purpose is firm. The double-minded man can never uh, keep a steady course. So these are, you need to have clarity, and that clarity really reduces frustration. Number three, it allows for concentration. It allows for concentration. If you feel like I'm going fast, I am, because I'm trying to get to the good part, where we can kind of chew on it a little bit. It allows for concentration. Have you heard of laser? Laser is the same as these lights. All of this light is light. But a laser puts all those lights, to, all that light together into one spot, and that's able to cut diamond. That's able to cut through flesh and blood and it's, it's, it's able to operate, you're able to do crazy stuff with a laser. That, that's what focus can do. Imagine every single one in your church wanting the same thing. Imagine everyone knowing this is what we're after. This is what success looks like. This is what it means when we are succeeding. And at the end of the month, when you look at the numbers, everybody's like, yeah, we did it. Everybody on the same page. Except the treasurer, he'll always, you know, be on a different page uh, because he is working with Excel. <laughs> but everyone's on the same page. So number one, it builds morale. Number two, it reduces frustration. Number three, it allows for concentration. Think of laser. Think of laser. Number four, it attracts cooperation. It attracts cooperation. So somebody's trying to do a slow turn on a scooter <laughs> on the side of the street. Oh, murta, murta, the fellow fell, falls off. He's going so slow, he falls off. And then one guy goes to help him. Okay? One guy runs to help him out. And then the second and the third guy also comes. Now how do they know what to do? Was there a committee meeting? Huh? Was there a leader there? How do they know what to do? Everybody knows we are trying to help this guy get his scooter back up again. You know, it's a simple illustration. But everybody knows and everybody tries to do that. Koi scooter or hatha, koi helmet or hatha, koi jiji or hatha, and they put it back on the scooter down. Right? It attracts cooperation. When everybody's trying to do the same thing, it attracts cooperation. When you've got one person who's wanting something else as the outcome, one person who's wanting something else as the outcome, and then you never, and all the committee meetings, the prayer meetings, the, the, the planning meetings, the camp meet, everything is spent just to get on the same page. I spent 27 years just trying to get on the same page. You know? And we want harmony. We want harmony. And that one guy will always oppose everything. So the whole world is waiting for either that one guy to agree or for Jesus to come. <laughs> and we know that Jesus is going to come sooner than that, that, that he's going to do. It's very difficult. And I'm going to get even deeper into this. And I've been in this game. I fought this fight. I've 
it's, it's, I, I've had tough seasons in my ministry. I've had great seasons in my ministry. And the hardest seasons has been dealing with people who have disrupted the ministry, flow of ministry, momentum of ministry, because they're just not on the same page. And I'm going to get to a point where we'll discuss openly, honestly, can you check the quality of people and get them onto the page, same page, on day one? On day one. Yeah, are you in or are you out? Because this is what we're about. And if you don't clear it in the beginning itself, we call that membership. We call that signing the vision. If you don't clear it right in the beginning, you're going to be in trouble. Because the only thing we agree on in the beginning is theology. Do you believe there is one God? And it's a boy. <laughs> you give that. Okay, okay, come on, come on in. And we don't know that he has some twisted ideas about how this is done or how that is done. By the time you put him and make him chairman of the committee, and then you find out it's too late. Everybody feeling the pain? Yes. Yeah, all right. At least three parts of the way here. I'm with you. <laughs> Rewind. <laughs> all right. So it assists. Attracts cooperation and finally it assists evaluation. It assists evaluation. So when I'm evaluating whether with my, when I'm sitting with my team, with my elders, deacons, pastors, I'm sitting with my uh, administrative team, and I'm deciding, we succeed, did we not succeed? Nobody's going to take it personally. Because everybody's on the same page. Everybody knew that this is what I needed to be done. Everybody knew what their ministry was. And no one's going to take it. They know he's pointing at me. He's pointing at me. He's saying that we failed because, because of me. And all that nonsense is avoided when we do this. All right, let's go uh, quick review of the first. Of why it is important to define our church's purposes. Why it is important that from the front guy to the last guy, from the man to the woman, from families to singles, it's good to know what the purpose of the church are from day one. Number one, it builds morale. Number two, it reduces frustration. Number three, it allows concentration. Number four, it attracts cooperation. And last, assist evaluation. All right? Right. The purpose driven church asks the question, okay, it's not personalities, it's not tradition, it's not finances, what is it? What is it? It says, it asks the question, what are the purposes of God? What does God want? What is God committed to, God invested in? And you get the five purposes from the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. My church calls it the Great Suggestion, but it is the Great Commandment. The Great Commandment and the Great Commission. Love the Lord your God. You know this? With all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like, love your neighbor as yourself. This is when Jesus was summarizing the Ten Commandments, answering this guy. And you have love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. Then you have the Great Commission. The Great Commission is revealed in two Gospels. But in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples. From where? All nations. Baptizing them. <coughs> out in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. It says in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? Quick lesson there. And teaching them to do. Not to be. Teaching them to do everything that I have commanded. Alright. So the five purposes are right here. Are there more? Well, they mostly fall under these five purposes. Number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart. We call that worship. We call that worship. Worship is not singing. Singing is worship, but worship is not singing. Worship is loving God. Loving God with everything on the altar. Love, love God with all your heart. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. We call that ministry. Because you can't serve without loving, you can't love without serving. We call that ministry. Okay? Worship. Aradhana. Ministry. Sevkai. Okay? Number three. <coughs> this goes into the next one, the Great Commission. Go make disciples. Make disciples. We call that mission or evangelism. Mission or evangelism. Number four. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptize and bringing them into the fellowship. So let me explain this real quick. So that we don't misunderstand what we mean by baptism. This is not reteaching the theology of baptism. But what we're saying is when a person is baptized, they go under the water, abandoning their personal 
identity and life, I'm dead to myself, and coming out, embracing the, 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 the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ, I belong to Christ, I identify with Christ. And it is a public event for the world, demons and angels to know that I am Christ, I belong to Christ, I am His. Right? Now, Jesus is in heaven, and the church is on earth. So the only people you can identify with is the people on earth. So the church is what you join to be able to identify. So that's how we get fellowship. So to come into membership or to fellowship with the church is to make disciples, or, or sorry, to, to be baptized. When you baptize people, they are identifying with Jesus, but they are also identifying with the church. They're standing with the church. Some people in our country say, oh, you know what, it's just between Jesus and me. I don't like to go to any church. In fact, I like to go to all churches. And I like to be part of everything. And there's so much to learn. Oh, please. Seriously. My arm has been stuck to one body for the last 50 years. And it's been perfectly fine. It doesn't go changing around every body. Right? This arm belongs to this body. And when I shake my hand, you are, you, you are you're shaking hands with me. Not with my arm. So membership is connected to the identity, is connected to the head. And we have to teach our people what membership is all about. I'll talk to you later about that. Right? So fellowship is bringing people into the body. Uh, and we do that at the point of darkness. And lastly, discipleship. Lastly, discipleship. Teaching them to do. Teaching them to do. This is not an instruction of the rules. This is an instruction of obedience. You're teaching obedience. Obedience is a character. So you're teaching the character of obedience. All right? So number one, everybody together with me. Worship. Two, ministry. Three, evangelism. Four, fellowship. Five, discipleship. This is the fivefold, or rather the five purposes of God's, God for the church. This is what we want to build our church on. When these purposes drive our church, we are called purpose. Cut up, simple, that's it. These five purposes. You say, well, Pastor Jeremy, I already knew that. I didn't know. But we're framing it in such a way that we get everybody on the same page and we structure our church and we instruct our church so that everything is ensuring obedience. Everything is ensuring the purposes of God. Jesus modeled this ministry in John 17. The church modeled it in Acts chapter 2. Paul modeled it in Ephesians chapter 4. And in all the New Testament stuff following the Great Commission, you see the church obeying this. So what does the church exist to do? Obey the Lord. The church exists to fulfill the purposes of God. What are the five purposes of God? Please write it down. Number one, the church exists to celebrate God's presence. The church exists to celebrate God's presence. That's installed our master. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Oh, we love to worship. No way. We? we love to worship. Why? Because we We love Jesus. We love his presence. We love to be together. One day in the house of the Lord is better than a thousand. Elsewhere. I was glad when they said it to me, come into the house of the Lord. I love to be in the presence of God. There's freedom, there's joy, there's healing, there's liberty. There's, oh, it's great to be there. So one thing that we do, one of the purposes is worship. We love God's presence. We express <coughs> that worship to God. Number two, the church exists to communicate God's word. The church exists to communicate God's word. That's evangelism or missions. Write that down. Evangelism or missions. The most important thing is that I complete my mission, Paul says in the book of Acts. The work, uh, the, uh, uh, the work, not Paul, Acts says, the work the Lord gave me to do, to, 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 to tell people the good news about the grace of God. To tell me, you will be my witnesses. Acts chapter 1 was saying, you know that one very well. Alright, so you know this? The word of God, evangelism, mission, to teach God's word. Alright, number three. Incorporate God's family. Number three, the church exists to incorporate God's family. The family is not complete yet. All are not in yet. God wants every single last one who wants to, to be part of his family. So we are out there bringing people into the family. Not bringing them into a theology. 
You're not bringing them into a into a, a, a vacuum of of a school of thought or a philosophy. You're not just teaching them a lifestyle. You're bringing them back to the Father. You're bringing them back to the Father. Incorporate God's family. Encourage. You are a member of God's very own family, and you belong. Look at those words: member, belong. You belong in God's household with every other believer. Wow, beautiful. Number four. The church exists to educate God's people. The church exists to educate God's people. Educate God's people. That means we want people to grow. We want people to mature. We want people to do well. We want people to know God, know themselves, and know God's purposes for life. Building up a church, the body of Christ, to a position of strength and maturity. Other words used for maturity in the Bible are perfect or complete. God wants us complete. Baby shouldn't come out until it's complete. Man should get married until he is. You pull him out of the oven too early. All right, that's a whole other seminar. <laughs> Number five. Number five. The church exists to demonstrate God's love. The church exists to demonstrate God's love. So we need to serve. We need to teach people to serve. We need to teach people that they should serve. We need to teach people how to serve. Right? So we teach people. We'll, we'll unpack all of this. Let's go over it from the top. The church exists to celebrate God's presence. Two, communicate God's word. Three, incorporate God's family. Four, educate God's people. Five, demonstrate God's word. I know we're still demonstrate God's love. I know we're still in the, in the zone of what you already know. I know that. But once we have set this foundation, we're going to talk about how do we do it? How do we structure the church? How do we assign people ministry? How do we bring in volunteers? How do we set up leadership? How do we train everyone? How do we move people from A to Z? How do we get people to grow? And we're going to talk about all of that. Because when I was a 23-year-old uh, fellow, and I was just beginning ministry. And when I'm 22, I came back from Bible College, 23 to 26. I took a job in a school and I was working. Started to figure out this whole pastoral thing, you know. And I said, you know what, I can't disciple more than 10 people. Really, I mean, really get into their lives. Deal with them. I can't disciple more than 10 people at a time. So this is going to take forever. How can I set this up in, in a way that really moves people like a conveyor belt through the process so it happens without me. And as I was thinking, I realized that Pastor Rick Warren thought about that 25 years ago. And he had already figured that out. And he was asking the same questions when he was 25. And he wrote this book, and my dad gave me this book because my dad doesn't know what to do with books. He only reads Genesis to Maps. And he had 56 years, he has served the Lord and brought half of India to Christ just doing that. So he said, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> I took it to Kazakhstan. I sat in my wife's country house there. And I didn't go out because I didn't know the language. And I rewrote that entire book by hand. Like I rewrote it. I removed everything I thought was American. Well, that's not going to work here. And then I said, Let, let's see what's going to work here. And I put it down to 60 pages of handwritten notes. And I said, how can I do this? So all of this stems from a desire to make disciples. To make disciples. We want to make disciples. We want to be able to put people on a process. Pastor, you can't do it all alone. And even if you do it, and if you do a great job, you're going to only do it with what? 20 people, 30 people, and every year. And we talk about multiplication, but seriously, come on. How many people actually multiply from, our, from the guys we... You see what I'm saying? So we don't base anything on us. I might be amazing, but those still don't base it on me. And then we go forward with a system, a process a way of doing things, so that everybody who walks in the door gets it. You're like, ah, okay, I can do this. I can do this part. And we're going to talk about how that breaks down. Your church to commit to God's purposes. How to lead, because the toughest thing is to change mindsets. Half the reason this place is not super packed and people aren't coming in hundreds is because, hmm, what are they teaching different? What do I need to change? I already got everything sorted. I think what our way is good is a good way. We, we don't want to change. We don't want to evaluate. We don't want to check. 
whether there's a better way or whether there are the ways to improve. All of us struggle with that. So when I take this back to my church and I'm beginning to make slight, slight modifications and changes to the mindset, to the teaching, it's very important that I go back to God's word. It's very important that I go back to God's word. Because this is not Rick Warren. This is not America. This is not a school of thought. This is not a quick, quick fix or a quick formula to grow the church. This is the word of God. So I go back. When I first read that book, I rewrote the whole thing in 60 pages. I didn't say a word to anybody. Our church was about 120, 30 people at that time. Um, and I didn't say a word to any, I just went back and I followed this and I said, I'm going to start teaching through the five purposes. I'm going to teaching through the five purposes. And I brought changes very slowly in terms of appointing, you know, structuring, getting people to understand the process, implementing the class and the, the membership maturity ministry mission, which we will explain later. And I, I did it very, very slowly. And people were able to absorb it more easy. And once they did it over a period of a year, we went from 150 people to 450 people in three years. Within three years, actually two years beyond this first year that I actually taught. So the one year I'm teaching, two years they actually grew and we went from 150 to 450 to the point where we now to rethink how do we handle this kind of growth then it hit a plateau then it began to and i worked through some other issues then it began to grow more slowly and then we got to 800 and then we hit a plateau then we then you know we began to grow and when i left that church it was 1250 people it's not all about growth it's about sending it's about discipleship it's about worship evangelism etc but you can't bring change suddenly if I told you, if you'd asked me that 30 years ago, I was like, yes, we'll do it. Now we'll do it. Because that was me 20 years ago, 30 years ago. But today, no. Nah. It has to be slow. And unfortunately, we guys, pastors, leaders, you know, committed ones, we are enthusiastic. We're going we're gonna to bring about change. Or we're going to bring about improvements. Or we're going to implement something. And everybody else is not with us. And then we feel discouraged. And we go. I hit the problem before I hit the point. The problem is that, no, you can't bring it a, a, about immediately. And you need to let it cook in you first. And it took me three years to get it. It took me three years to kind of figure this whole thing out. And as I was chewing on it, I began to see God put it to work. By the way, everything you're already doing is great. You're doing right. Everything you're already doing is blessed. Your ministry is already blessed and anointed. We're not trying to more anoint your ministry. There can be no more of God in your ministry. You're already doing great. What we're saying is, are there strategies or ways to win more people quicker? To bring more people onto board quicker? To get more people involved in the church quicker? Is there a better way? Is there a way to use the gifts of the other people so that everything is not depending on me? That's the heart of this whole thing. I'm not talking about... Doctrine, theology, and anointing. No, not talking about that at all. Right. So there's a slow way or there's a long way. And it's, it's both. <laughs> Number one, lead your members in a study of the biblical passages about the church. The local members have not actually studied the purpose of the church and boiled it down to a sentence. We give them all these different things and they know that this, 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 all of those things are the purposes of the church and God wants this, God wants that, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But we don't boil it down to what are the one, two, three, four, five things that we need to do in order to hit the jackpot, okay? Whenever my wife tells me to go shopping, I'm like, don't tell me all these things, you write it down. Just write it down, what are the three things you want? And I'll go get that. Then I know I've succeeded. You know, then I know I've succeeded. So I want to do that even with God. So number one, lead your members in a study of the biblical passages. Have you seen the biblical passages in front of you? Is it there? Those are some of the passages that cover the purposes of God. Number two, ask two questions. What are we to be as a church? And what are we to do as a church? You have that? Great. What are we to be as a church and what are we to do as a church? Number three, and this should be a slow process with your core team, with your key people 
who are involved in the decision making and the, the vision of your church. Write a summary of your answers to these questions. Edit out all the unnecessary words and make it as brief as possible. Let me give an example. In my church, I said, why do we exist? We exist to love Jesus and to love like Jesus. Simple. We exist to love Jesus and to love like Jesus. We exist to make disciples by... We need, exist to make disciples, mature and connected disciples of Christ. We exist to make mature and connected disciples of Jesus. I mean, I boil it down to bare minimum, right? So that people can catch it. Even the business world is getting this. <laughs> Even the management world has already figured this out. In the church, we're like, no, 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 no. We don't want, other than God's word, we don't. No, no, it's, it's good. Just for you to know. Put it on the wall. Let the people come in and say, okay, this is what we're about. Number three, write a summary. Number four, shorten your summary into a single sentence. And this becomes your church's purpose statement. It's very easy to say it. It's very easy to get other people to say it. Okay? Into one single sentence. This becomes your church's purpose statement. Even companies have a purpose statement. Even coffee shops have a purpose, purpose statement. Do you know that Starbucks, their single purpose is to create meaningful conversations over coffee. Nailed it. It's not about the coffee. It's to create ne meaningful conversation about, around coffee. So, <clears throat> number one, is it biblical? Your purpose statement, is it biblical? Is it from the Bible? Number two, you can't say we're going to be awesome. That, that's, that's not biblical. <laughs> you may be awesome, but you're not, it's not. Number two, is it specific? Do people get it? Can people repeat it? Can a five-year-old repeat it? Number six, number three, is it memorable? Can you remember it? Is it short enough to remember and pass it on to others? No big long words, English, you know, Hindi, maximized, long syllables, many syllables. Okay, number three, number four, is it measurable? Is it measurable? So you can evaluate at the end of every church year. So at the end of your church year, you're not just giving a report on the finances and kitne programs give them. You know, you're actually giving a report whether you hit the target, whether you actually hit the purposes. How are we on worship? Eight out of ten. Ah, oh, not bad. How are we on, on, you see what I'm saying? Discipleship, evangelism, fellowship, uh, we evaluate ourselves. So make it short, make it quick. There's a quicker way to do it. There's a quicker way to do it is to get the whole church to do the 40 days of, uh, of purpose. This is a campaign that Pastor Rick wrote as home group material. He just wrote it for the small groups. He never planned to publish it. It wasn't supposed to be a best-selling book, all-time bestseller, nothing. He just, he, he said, and he went into his uh, office, he was out for about two, three months, and he wrote this campaign. For every day there was a devotion. And that happened to become the purpose-driven uh, life. And that book kind of went all around the countryside. So you could do that as a campaign for 40 days and help people find their purpose in their life and in the church's life. So that's a quick way of doing it. You can adopt a slogan or a statement, make that for your congregation and push it out there and teach it through that. Let me give you what Saddleback talks about. They say a great commitment to the great commandment and a great commission will grow a great church. Do you have that? Yeah, so that's theirs, that's theirs. And uh, their purpose statement is to bring people to Jesus and membership in his family, to develop them to Christ-like maturity, to equip them for their ministry and to, in the church and in their life mission in the world. So you've got membership, maturity, ministry, mission. And finally, live to magnify God, that's worship, right? So you've got all the five purposes right there. The next thing you want to do is to establish classes you don't have to say class you don't have to use class but to establish a system where you're moving people from a to b to c to d you could change it however you want it but we want to help people understand what does it mean to join the church have a class teach it finish it get them to sign hanji kalyaman i understood it because if you don't do that then you're expecting people to figure it out. I really want you to get this. The importance of a class, I mean, when it comes to science, you do class. When it comes to maths, you do class. 
when it comes to studies and, 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 and information, you do the class, then you take an examination. Did you get it? Did you get it? How many marks did you get? Oh, no, you didn't get it. It's only 60%. Only 40%. You didn't get it. Do it again. You know? Why, why do why does it do it? Because we want to make sure that you understood it. So as people come in and as they move forward, we establish periods of their journey with Christ where they understand what it means to be a member of the church. We call that fellowship or we call that membership class. What does it mean to grow in Christ? We call that maturity or we call that discipleship class. What does it mean to understand my gift, my talents and use it for God? Why should I use it for God? What does God want me to do? How does I place my job and my ministry in priority? Class, discipleship, uh, ministry class. How do I understand? And then there's a mission class. How do I share the gospel? How do I go and minister to my friends outside? How do I have a ministry in the world? So you have a ministry in the church and you have a mission in the world. How do I do that? So you help people by establishing the class. So number three, establish an orientation class for every purpose so that you're teaching all five purposes. I repeat, establish an orientation class to help people understand every single purpose. <clears throat> Right now, I'm telling you about all the five purposes. But in the class, you talk about one purpose. Today, we're talking about fellowship. Two hours, three hours, four hours. Unpack it. Understand it. Not implement it. Go to home group. Go to small group. Then the next, one or two months later, three months later, let's talk about discipleship. What does it mean to be like Christ? Become like Christ. Act like Christ. Behave like Christ. Unpack it. Learn it. Take the four uh, habits of spiritual growth, implement it. Go back to your small group, implement it. Then three, few, four months later, come back. Okay, let's talk about your ministry. You've been growing in the Lord. You've joined the church. You need to serve because every, every member has a ministry to the body. What do we talk? You see what I'm saying? So if you have not brought them into the class, talk to them, train them and say, did you get it? Did you get it? Did you feel everything? Did you get it? Understand? Now tell, tell me. Explain it to me. If you have not done it, don't assume that they got it. I repeat. If you have not done that, don't assume that they got it. We are so amazing. We think that people just coming into our church, just coming through the door, just hanging out with us, the character of God will just get rubbed off on them. They'll just understand what this church is about. They'll just get in line. They'll just get involved. And we hit so many roadblocks because of that. All right? Yeah. To, for each of the purposes, just so that there is a clear period in time, right in the beginning as they join, so all the purposes are learnt in one shot. Not over a period of time, disorganizedly, you know, straight away as they come, we suggest, we suggest, class 101, teach what does membership mean. Sign the membership. Go to a small group and move forward. I'll explain all this in detail later. And then next, whenever you're ready, next one. Whenever, in quick su succession, not too long, not too many gaps, move them through the five purposes, and we call that purpose training. So they now know all the five purposes, and now they're on board with you. They not only know why they're here, they know where they're going. Good question. Yeah? And we'll unpack that, we'll talk about that on, on how, how to do it. All right. So establish an orientation class for it. Number four, follow up with the study of the purpose driven church simulcast of work. Like, go over this and keep on re reviewing it. Okay? Number two, how do you commun communicate your purposes? How do you communicate your purposes? So one is you to take it through classes, right? You've already taught the purpose, but you've got to keep on communicating. This is what we're about. This is what we're about. Come on, everybody. This is what we're about. Worship, evangelism, fellowship, ministry, discipleship. Worship, evangelism, fellowship, ministry, discipleship. Why? Because we want balance. If you don't repeat, you and don't review, you won't remember. If you don't remember, you will neglect. You won't remember, you neglect. You should drink water. You should drink water every day. Here's some water. You should drink water. Why should I remind you? Because if I don't remind you, you'll forget. If I remind, unhealthy. Balance, health. All right? So communicating God's purposes. There are five ways to communicate God's purposes, God's vision uh, purposes. One is slogans. You can use one-liners. In Hindi, one-liners don't work so much. I've noticed, uh, you know, Ache din aayenge, but thik hai. Okay. You know, at campaign time it works. But ongoing, I don't think, you know, hum do, hamare do, I don't know, that hasn't worked. <laughs> With you always, forever. Uh, Delhi police? I, that's, I don't know. 
that hasn't worked, right? Nike can just do it became Nike, I just did it. Right? So slogans, you need to figure out in your language, does it work? Nepali, does it work? You know, but have a way to keep communicating. Number two, symbols. Symbols are very powerful. Please be careful. In an India, in a country like India, <laughs> symbols can become dangerous. <laughs> it can become dangerous. Okay, but Hitler knew the power of a symbol. Okay, religions know the power of a symbol. Faiths know power of a symbol. Armies know the power of symbol. Yeah, patriot, patriotic people know the power. You see a symbol, you're like, <laughs> yeah. How does it? You know, symbols are powerful. And one of the greatest symbols we have is the cross. The place of shame has become the place of grace. The thing that was cursed, cursed is he who hangs on a tree, has become a thing that we, it brings us to our knees and in repentance to God. It's become the most dearest thing to us. So apart from the cross, can we have other non-threatening symbols? Yeah, let me, see, let me give you some examples. I had a friend of mine design some of in Russia, in Moscow, and we, we use theirs. We don't use the ones from Saddleback because you don't have to. And so we designed these other ones. And here are symbols so that you understand it's not like religious and you don't have to freak out about it. But so we designed these. What do you think this one is? Fellowship. Fellowship? Membership. You're right. Okay, that's membership. This one? Closest discipleship. You see what I'm saying? So when you, 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 you and um, this is? Working together. Okay, ministry. Ministry. This is? Yeah, evangelism. Preaching about the cross. And this is? No, uh, this is evangelism. This is evangelism, this is worship. Something like that. Okay, so you get, it's not like intense, it's not like, you know, swastika and all that. You just, it's just... <coughs> You know, so number one, slogans. Number two, use symbols. Number three, scriptures. Teach the scriptures. Teach key scriptures. Okay, apart from the Great Commission and Great Suggestion, teach scriptures. Number four, tell stories. Or stories is an S word for testimonies. Tell stories. Have a discipleship story. Oh, this one I was doing. And, he was, and, we were, and then I've, now he's come to, he's become so mature because I, this is what I did. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So you tell a discipleship. Tell an evangelism story. In the worship ministry, in the, in the bulletin, uh, on YouTube, churches, YouTube, whatever. Tell stories. Tell stories. Keep telling stories. But stories based on purpose. Stories based on purpose. An evangelism story. A worship story. You keep on pushing it so that through that you're pushing the purposes. And lastly, specifics. People love numbers. People love numbers. Write down specifics and, and share that. Okay. So there are different ways... Saddleback does it. They use the membership class. They use the annual messages. So even I teach every six months, I do a purpose uh, campaign. Every six months, I run the whole congregation through the purposes. So we are remembering. Then what I do is every month, I focus on one purpose. People don't even know I'm doing that. They don't need to know you're doing that. You're just making sure vegetable khaya, vegetable khali hai. Meat khali, meat, meat khali hai. Did they get a little bit of fat? Did they get a little bit of protein? Yeah, yeah, yeah done that. Okay, vitamins, done that. You are the feeder. You're, you're, you're the one who's taking care of your Sunday school class or your, you know, your, your worship team or whatever. You make sure that they're getting a balanced diet. So we, uh, <coughs> we use annual messages. We use a monthly emphasis. We use testimonies. We use um, Bible studies. Even in the home group, we, we focus on one particular worship, right? Have you got this grid that says explaining the church's purposes? You have the, you got that? All right. <clears throat> On the left, you have the purposes. That is outreach or evangelism. You have worship, fellowship, discipleship, and service. Okay? And then in the task section, you talk about what are you supposed to do in those things. And in the outreach, you basically evangelize. In worship, you exalt. In fellowship, you encourage. In discipleship, you build up or edify. In service, you equip. Then you've got the verses that help or support that. Then you've got the objective. What is the objectives? The objective is mission in outreach. The objective is to magnify God in worship. The objective is membership in fellowship. The objective is maturity. I'm just going through this because you're smart enough to pick this up. You getting this? If you have any questions, please ask me. So you've got maturity and then finally ministry. Who is your target audience? Who is your target audience? And this is where we want to slowly pick up on the symbols. You see the circles? 
the concentric circles, you begin to understand that we are working with different circles and in each purpose we have a particular task, each purpose we have a particular objective and each purpose we have a particular life component. So the target audience in outreach, who would it be? The community. The community outside, right? The community, you're, you're not far off brother, but the community outside. When you invite them to church, they don't become believers immediately. When you invite them to a coffee, when you invite them to an evangelistic crusade, invite them to a concert, they don't become believers immediately. But as soon as they come into your purview, they're connected with you, you have their phone number, you've shaken their hand, now they become crowd. So what do you do with the community? You do evangelism. They don't know the Lord. Then they come into the crowd. What do you do with the crowd? You do worship. You do worship. So the life component is my witness to the community. The life component is my worship to the crowd. What is the crowd watching? When they come, when you bring your unbelieving friends, loved ones, when you bring your family to just where the church gathers, everybody comes. Sometimes even the devil shows up there, sits in the second row. Right? Everybody comes and everybody's welcome. Jesus spoke to the crowds. He spoke to the multitudes. Great, fantastic. So when you're doing that, we worship and we exalt and we lift up and we speak out the wonderful things. David says, I will give testimony in the general assembly. He says, I will give testimony. I'll speak of the great things of God in the general assembly. Everybody come listen to what I have to say about God. So our worship exalts the Lord and it is a witness even in the crowd. Is that the church? Answer, no. That is not the church. At this point, I want to make a slight distinction. So here's where you want to ask the question. Do you want unbelievers to come to your Sunday morning service? Do you want unbelievers? So it's a strategy issue. The question is, what are you doing and what is the purpose of that event? Okay. So for me, my Sunday morning is for the crowd. Bring in the crowd. And my home group or small group is for discipleship. So that's where the church is. So don't look at the crowd and say, see what kind of church has got all sorts of smokers and, and you know, all sorts of people and you know, where sometimes they come, sometimes they don't come, no commitment level, some are worshipping, some are not worshipping, you know. You don't look at the crowd, the janta and say that's the church. You look at the worshippers who are following Acts chapter 2 verse 42 to 47. Following. Devoted. Apostles teaching. Word. Breaking of bread. Prayer. Those are the believers. And if you're going to allow unbelievers on Sunday morning, you're going to have to make some adjustments. Because when the guests come home, you do act differently. You're a little bit more hospitable, loving. You give them the best seats in the house. You, you, you take care of them. So there's some change. And we'll talk about that later. But at this point, I want you to know the difference. Because I come from a background a church background where Sunday morning was for believers. Then we had Sunday evening, which was the gospel meeting. Okay? And few of us will come and we'll bring one unbeliever from the street. And he'll come in from the street, usko And we'll all sit and everybody knows who the unbeliever is. Because we're all looking at him like this, waiting for him to repent. And then the preacher preaches. We've done the worship, preacher preaches and we're all looking at him. You know, and that's how we grow. I'm like, poor guy. And then I asked, have we never asked the question why none of them ever come back? <laughs> ever. So you rethink, you rethink. If a guest comes to your home, a guest comes to your restaurant, you want them to come back, right? Until they feel your love, until they feel the connection, feel the community, and they'll say, I want to be part of this. And here's a psychology that you have to understand even more with Indians than anybody else. Okay? Here's where I often ask the question, why do people fall in love first and then get married? You know? Because India says you get married and then you fall in love. That's called arranged marriage. But over here we want to fall. And people fall in love. With, and and, and I, I tell my, my young people, I don't tell them enough, but I tell them my young people, say don't, don't invest too much into the relationship because then you'll begin to fall for the person. 
And if you haven't put, if it's an unbeliever or whatever, you haven't, they begin to develop a relationship, then affection, and then after that, they're ready to make any changes to their, uh, any changes to their life in order to get married to that person because now they want to know, they, want, they know that they want to be with that person. Wow. So relationship comes before belief. Relationship comes before belief. People come into your community and they first decide, do I even want to be part of these people? Or they step out and say, oh, me and Jesus is okay. I don't want to be part of The church is hypocritical. The church is legalistic. The church is, you see what I'm saying? So if we are to be a people that have open arms and want crowds to come, crowds to stay, we need to ask the question, what is our service like? And we'll talk about that later. But this is where the change of the purpose, where evangelism to the community, worship in the crowd, and then we move to the next one, which is, uh, uh, which is um, congregation. Okay, so you got congregation, committed, uh, and core. In the life components, you got my witness, my worship, because we're going to unpack all of these. I'm not wasting any more time on this. My walk and my work. What's the basic human need that we're meeting in each of the three, each of the circles? Number one. The purpose to live for. God has, have a, has a purpose for your life. Power to live on. God has given you his presence and his promises. People to live with. God has given you a family. Principles to live by. God has given you his word and instruction. And finally, pro, uh, profession. What am I living for? What am I, what am I doing with my life? You got it? Right. The church purpose or the church provides the a ministry to each of these people. You provide a focus for living in evangelism. You provide a force for living uh, in worship. You provide a family for living. You provide a foundation for living and a function for living. What about your emotional benefits? What do you get emotionally in the community? You get significance. Jesus gives you a new identity. You get stimulation. Worship lifts you up into the presence of God. You get support because you've got family. You get stability because you've got teaching and instruction. You get service because you are able to show your own love to people through ministry. That's an amazing grid right there. Talking about how to communicate your purposes. So what do you communicate to the community? Come on. What do you communicate to the community? Yeah, witness. It's Jesus is Lord. He loves you. Come to Christ. Right. You don't say that in your small group. Right. Hopefully you don't have to say that. And then what do you say to the crowd? What do you communi communicate to the crowd? Worship. Exalt the Lord. What do you communicate to the congregation? Fellowship, family, we are loved, we are together, we are with each other. We love. What do you communicate to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the committed people? Maturity, discipleship, walk with Jesus, change your ways, love God, look more like Christ. Alright, what do you communicate to the core? Ministry, come on, get involved, find your shape, let's serve. What do you want to do for, for, for Jesus? Right? So with every different circle you change your focus you change your ministry and you you're communicating what have we been talking about communicating your purpose you don't go to the community and tell them all five purposes you don't go to and tell them all. so as they come in you move them in baby steps of commitment to uh, the core all right now how do you apply these purposes how do you apply your purposes how do you apply your purpose it's not enough to just define it's not enough to just communicate we've done that well but you must also apply the purposes in the church. Why? Because the key to application is balance. The key to application is balance. If you don't apply it, you won't be balancing it. Another nice word for apply is obey. You're not obeying all of it. You're applying it, right? Here's another grid. Here's another grid. You have different types of churches, and this is slightly funny. You have different types of churches that are swinging in one particular direction. You have the soul-winning church... You have a soul winning church that's only concerned with evangelism. Okay? The pastor is like an evangelist. People's role are all witnesses. Okay? Everybody go out. Come on. Reach the soul. Reach the lost. Come on. Go out. And then you have a target audience which is a community. Key word. Key term. We have to save souls. We have to save souls. Central value. How many decisions for Christ? That kind of thing. Then you have the experiencing God church where everything about that church is the worship experience. Light, smoke, action, music, screen, uh, synth, and everything's working for the worship. And the, uh, the big thing is 
worship and the pastor is a worship leader, the worship leader is a worship leader, the deacon is a worship leader, everybody is a worship leader. Okay, people are the worshippers and in the crowd it's all about the feel. It's all the key term is, did you feel the presence of God? Did you feel God in this place? Personal experience, music, prayer. And we, we talk about the spirit. As if the spirit is, is, is there in the place based on that. Okay, some people are into experiencing God. Some people are in the family church. We are family. Same family for 40 years. 100 years, my grandfather was here. My great-grandfather was here. And we're a bit of a family church. We're in potluck, you know picnics all of that then you got a bible classroom church that's the other one i went to the other church i went to you got the ring binder or the spiral notebook you got your highlighters your pens your bible you're taking notes come on pastor teach me teach me and every class was just one big every session was one big lesson quickly finish off the worship and let's do the teaching and it's only that and finally you have the social conscience church which is all about ministry hey if we're not making a difference in the community we are not obeying the great commission we need to be out there what is wrong with these churches nothing wrong with each of them they're just out of balance the truth is we need all of them so you have the purpose driven church the purpose driven church has all these okay what is the primary focus Balance all five purposes. What is the pastor's role? He's an equipper. What are the people's roles? They are ministers. Who are you targeting? All five audiences. What is the key term? Be, do. Be, do. What is the central value? Become like Christ. Christ like character. What are the tools we use? Life development process. Purpose training. Life development process. What is the source of leg 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 legitimacy? Change lives change lives how do you know a church is successful a bunch of testimonies change lives okay you say but pastor Jeremy there's a lot in every church you have yeah yeah but we're not pushing for that that's not the central value now here's one thing between you and me just between you and me from my experience if I'm good at soul winning or I like soul winning or I'm good at Bible teaching and I like Bible teaching and I want balance here's where the rubber meets the road if I'm good at one thing or two things, which I will be, I'm not going to be good at five things. How do I maintain balance? How do I ensure that somebody is championing all five purposes? And that is what I want you to think about clearly, carefully as we move forward. Number three, how do you apply the purposes? Unless we set up an intentional process and plan, it's not going to happen. All right, let's go to the next page where we have the circles. Where we have the circles how to balance the five purposes in fact I've already taught you this I've already taught you this what do you do with the community evangelism what do you do with the crowd come on everyone worship what do you do with the congregation fellowship what do you do with the committed discipleship what do you do with the ministry with the core ministry what do you do with the commissioned about turn tejak about turn the job. Go outside. Go start the whole process all over again. Right? Great. Okay. What it means to be a purpose-driven church. Remember we started by saying what it is not. What is not? Good. Now let's talk about what it is. What is a purpose-driven church? And let me talk about 10 ways to fulfill God's purposes and be a purpose-driven church. Number one. What are the 10 marks that say, okay, this, this is a purpose-driven church? Number one, you assimilate your new members on purpose. Quickly, immediately, intentionally, you assimilate your new members. As soon as somebody walks in, you make sure that they've got the purpose training. Make sure that they know the vision of the church. Make sure that they know where we're headed and you get them on board. We call that assimilation. Assimilation, okay? You grow a healthy church by balancing all five purposes. You grow a stronger church by continually deepening that commitment. And you grow a larger church from the outside in rather than from the inside out. Let me explain that. <clears throat> Every church normally grows from the inside out. What does that mean? 20 log hai, 40 log hai, 100 log hai. Okay, now you go and reach the world. And they're like, oh, I, have, I, have to go. I don't have time, Pastor. Next Sunday I can come. So between Sunday and Sunday, there's no reaching the world. You know, it goes, oh, going into the world, but there's no reaching the world. So you're often wondering how and when do we actually 
fulfill the five purposes okay so rather than saying you start with the core and then reach go out to the community you start with the community and then move down to the core please understand this this is integral in fact this is number one in being purpose driven it is ulta to what we normally do it is opposite normally we look at the committed people and say okay we're going to reach the world for jesus but what jesus did is he went to the shores of galilee and he began to teach he sat down to teach and thousands of people came he started with unbelievers he started with crowds he started with everyone the cynics were there CNN was there NDTV was there the Sanhedrin was there RSS was there everyone was there okay are you with me and they're all standing and he explained he preached he taught with authority with authority he taught the Word of God then from there many followed him and many discontinued okay but it's good odds because when you're starting with 5,000 people then that that's 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 a good place to start but when you start with three people and two leave it's just your wife right so you, you then, then then you don't know okay so many left some followed and then after that he said to me oh you want to you want to come come say, come see what I left come come and serve serve with me come watch come serve then he said come die you would have lost everybody but he said come and see and he taught and he taught and he taught and many of them grew and they kept following 500 70 12 3 1 and the 12 all gave their lives for Christ they all died they all were martyrs even Judas died but for some other reason are you with me so Jesus had a strategy and we are just saying you know what that's a better strategy start with the outer circle start with the masses and bring in and build commitment build commitment if you get three or four people and you start wanting to reach the whole world with those three people you'll you lose them also but we start the other way around so that's one major change that you made assimilate on purpose number two program around your purposes every program in your church needs to be around the purposes of God so who is your target community crowd congregation committed core commission what is your purpose evangelism worship fellowship discipleship ministry okay so what program do you have what do you have for community come on think with me community means evangelism evangelism means what what kind of program will you have bridge events engaging coffee with the ladies motorbike ride camps right yeah barbecues do just just come on connecting okay what do you do with the crowd crowd worship weekend services Sunday services now you may say no no in our church we can't uh, we can't open the Sunday morning to unbelievers uh, for whatever reasons so you change that and you do something else and say how do I start with the crowds where and how do I bring in the crowds I've been teaching this for years and on this matter pastors fundamentally agree and then don't do anything fundamentally agree and then don't do anything because I don't understand but pastors understand that. do you agree with me oh absolutely so are you going to reach the crowd oh yes and nothing is done to bring more and lots of people to Sunday morning agar nahi karna Sunday morning do it another time but what are you doing to bring in the crowds uh, evangelistic crusade karte. Achha, when oh annual Jesus said go into all the world every day and preach the gospel and you're doing annual and every annual crusade one fellow gets saved and by the end of the year he is the crusade manager because he's the only committed fellow around Thopos. Give him everything. Give him everything. One guy got saved, you just give him everything. And by the end of it, he's loaded. I'm joking. You know I'm joking. 
Okay? But the point of the matter is that it doesn't work. That's not how it works. You start with a crowd and you do crowd activities on a weekly basis. If you can't do Sunday mornings, it doesn't matter. Do something where you're reaching a crowd. How do you know you're reaching a crowd? My pastor, my dear friends, my brothers, my sisters, my dearly beloved. On a weekly basis, how many new names and phone numbers of unbelievers is coming into your diary, into your contact base? How many people are you texting for the first time every week? How many new believers got connected to your church first? You say, oh no, first we have to give them the gospel, then they need to get saved, then they need to be sanctified, and then they can come into my church. Whoa, I don't want to join your church. Because nobody, nobody grows like that. First I want to meet you, then I want to see whether I like you, then I'll decide whether I want to marry you. But first I want to be okay. Who are they going to meet? The church. Who's going to show them the love? The church. Who's going to give them the love, of the, the, the feel that this is where they always belong? This is family, the church. So belief comes after behavior. Psychologically, belief comes after behavior. And once they see Jesus is here, this is a, so we have to bring in unbelievers. Be a, you decide whether it's going to be Sunday morning or it's going to be Friday night. I don't care. That's not the point. The point is we start from the outside and we build it in. We build commitment as we move in. So, crowd, worship, weekend services. Again, I'm appealing to you. Think about this and make changes to reach crowds first. Number two, number three, congregation, fellowship, small groups. What do you call it, pastor? In your home, what do you, what do you in your school, what do you call it? In your church? Care cells. You have care cells, you have home groups, you have cell groups, you have, call it what you want. Call it what you want. We call it terrorist activity, but <laughs> yeah, just as long as it's not gossip central. Number, th number four, committed discipleship foundations. Foundations is a course we do where we teach the 11 doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. We start with 11 doctrines. Then from there we start, we go into book studies. From book studies we go into character studies and we deepen their character. And lastly, the commissioned, uh, the, the core ministry, we have several, several lay ministries where we do the training for lay ministry. So at every level you are program assisted, uh, making your programs, organizing your programs around the thing. The next thing we do is we educate your people. We educate your people on purposes. How do we do that? We do it with the class system. Class is C-L-A-S-S. -S, Christian Life and Service Seminars. Christian Life and Service Seminars. Uh, seminars. Indians get very excited when I say class because, you know, Indians, Indians like to attend class. Okay. I'm, I'm in. Right. But the point of class is Christian life and service seminars. So how can we train people? So if you look at this baseball diamond that Pastor Rick uh, kind of first drew on a napkin when he was 25 years old and he found out, I tried to change this and make it like cricket. Okay. Because baseball is the Samadhani I guess you go. Okay, so I thought, let's make it like cricket. But the problem with cricket is you run back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then you get out. I said, that's what we're already doing. <laughs> so, let's stick with this. So, I, know, I don't say diamond, I don't say baseball, I just say, class 101 is fellowship. So, a new person comes in. Sandeep comes into your church. The first thing you want him to do is understand what bishop, what membership is all about. Sandeep, what does it mean to be part of the world? And you start with class one. Then you move him to class 201. Big question, how long should you take between class 101 and 201? Here you decide. Between you and your small group leader, you decide. And after 201, you move them to class 301, where you discover your shape for ministry. From class 301, you move to 401, where you decide your mission in the world. We teach them two things in mission class. Number one, we teach them how to share the gospel. So that everyone in the church is trained how to share the gospel. And number two, we teach them the peace plan, which we will teach you tomorrow morning. And the peace plan is how to go into the community and serve the community. So you have it over there, class 101, what does it say? To lead people. Number 201, to grow people. 301, to equip people. 401, to enlist people. 501, to empower people. Okay, number four. 
is you form small groups around purpose. What are we talking about? We're talking about how to be a purpose-driven church. So the way we do purpose, we church, teach purposes, we simulate on purpose, we, we, we teach through the purposes, but we also program around small groups. So we have a small group that's meant for discipleship. Acha, this is happening. We have a small group that's meant for ministry. Acha, this group is going to the hospitals and they're going to cook food and they're going to visit the sick. This is the, this is the small group. So you're also part of this small group and you're also part of a discipleship small group because you're growing in your commitment. And your fellowship group, yeah, I also have a home group, a fellowship group, care cell, whatever else. So you have a care cell also, then you have now a ministry group also. Sometimes you're part of two ministry groups. Are you getting this? Are you getting this? Let me explain the difference. Most churches have a centralized ministry. Hospital ministry, yeah, mental health ministry or counseling ministry. Everything is centralized. And who is the chief? Who is the most tired guy? The pastor. Now we're saying, move the ministries to small groups and let small groups operate as that purpose. So you have a small group that takes on the ministry of taking care of the orphans or whatever. You have a small group that takes care of discipling certain other people or evangelism or whatever, like you're moving out, whatever. It's around a small group. So everything you're doing, you're doing in relationships. Not Sunday morning, not alone, but in relationships of a few people. And when you begin to build relationships, there's accountability. Why should I go to the gym with somebody else? I know you're saying, yeah, you should go to the gym. But why should I go to the gym with somebody else? Why should I quickly make a bunch of friends? Why are most sports played in teams? Help each other. You win together. You share together. You, you, you conquer together. You cry together, right? So we do ministry together as well. Very important. Form small groups based on purpose. Number five, you may not be able to do this, but you can try. Add staff on purpose. Have one guy who's focusing on fellowship. One guy focusing on discipleship. One guy focusing on ministry. That way, if the pastor is not inclined towards ministry or towards you know, mercy ministries or whatever, then at least that other guy will take care of it. So what kind of a person do you put in place to handle one particular purpose? What kind of a person do you choose for that purpose? Someone who's passionate about that. Someone who's passionate. He thinks and lives and breathes that particular purpose. Or he loves evangelism. Okay, then he'll gather the others who are passionate about that. And, and you never have to motivate this guy. Because he's committed to that purpose. He's committed to that purpose. And what happens? There's balance. Because while the pastor is not so much interested in that, he's definitely put somebody who is interested to ensure that is. And I don't say that the pastor does one and give four to the others. Uh-uh. You give all five to somebody who's passionate and you are the conductor. You step back. You are the coach. You are the mentor. And you pour into these guys as they do that. Number six. Structure by purpose, structure by purpose. Number seven, preach on purpose. And number eight, budget on purpose. Instead of talking about building programs, this and that, talk about how much money is going to go into evangelism. How much money is going to go into fellowship. How much money are we going to... So you begin to structure on purpose. We'll unpack this as we go forward. Number nine, calendar, calendar on purpose. Okay, February we're going to be focusing on missions. April, we're going to be focusing on discipleship, calendar on missions, build on purpose, a place for every purpose, build on purpose.